Okay, fourth week of this Epiphany series. We're uh, in uh, the places where we will be witnesses in the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and this week it's the ends of the earth. So as we um, as we focus on that, uh, the lessons that we've chosen for this week are um, lessons uh, that are in front of you. The first one is from the book of Jonah, because um, uh, Jonah is one of those uh, few prophets who were sent to somebody else besides the people of Israel in the Old Testament and demonstrated that um, uh, by that prophecy that God's love was meant for people of every tribe and nation. And, um, and as we know in the book of Jonah, it was sometimes much to the prophet's chagrin. Um, so let's, um, let's read that first one together as it's printed and then reflect on, um, on Jonah today. Okay. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Um, so there's a, a couple of different ways we can go in this uh, passage. And I thought one, um, uh, one way to start would just be to think a little bit about the value, challenge, or opportunities you see in a great city, a big city, a major metropolitan area. What does the Bible have to say about the cities? And what are cities as you think about the, the value or the blessing they bring to us, the big cities, uh, even in our own culture, what what blessings do we get out of a big city that you don't have in a little city? Better protection. Better what? Protection. Protection from? From being conquered. Um, we have poli bigger police departments. You know, other people that can make laws to help protect us. Yeah, cities were uh, kind of the organizing uh, principle. If you're if you're just li living out in the country side, you don't need a lot of laws. You think about people who pioneer. How much? How many laws did they have to have? Right. Yeah, because first of all, their interaction with other people wouldn't be that great. And cities are a place where you have a lot of interaction. You've got a lot of people packed in a smaller space. Um, and on the one hand, you need more protection. On the other reason, uh, the other uh, hand, the reason you need more protection is because you have more crime, right? Very often. Um, although I will tell you, having pastored in a rural area, that sometimes when people think of rural areas as more idyllic, I can tell you it's not necessarily so. You still have drug problems. You still have uh, uh, issues that uh, divide families. I dealt with more incest in my first two congregations than in any other congregations I've been a part of. You know, um, you, uh, uh, the other thing you don't have is you don't have a lot of entertainment. One of the things I found in rural areas is that they couldn't set, the kids did not set their sights very high because they couldn't see anything beyond what they grew up with. And there were kids who I thought, well, you know, this, this child's really got potential, but they ended up working in a feed mill, which is okay if that's what folks are voting, they're happy with. But sometimes you just saw kids who didn't, didn't have the opportunity or see the po possibility of developing particular gifts, talents, and abilities that they had that you have available in a city. You know, you don't build a college out in the 
backwoods except for Seward. <laughs> right? I mean, mo most of uh, colleges, universities. Um, any of you who have spent time up north and have had any kind of a medical issue would realize that the medical um, personnel able to serve in a place like that are far and few between. You know, the kind of clinics they have available to them and that kind of thing. And so I've often seen people who have moved up north in retirement and then moved back down to the city, especially as they had some medical conditions that needed more attention and more regular attention because it just wasn't possible up there. They didn't have the medical facilities or the or the medical personnel to deal with those same kind of issues. So if you look, if you think about where all the great medical um, um, uh, training facilities and universities are, they're all in the city, right? How many children's hospitals are there in the state? Not that many. And so um, uh, if you want people who are able to deal with uh, especially young children, you want a place like a children's hospital, but you can only have a children's hospital where there are enough children, right? Who are in need of, of, of care in places where that can interact. What else does the city give us? Well, you can buy almost anything quickly, easily, inexpensively. Yeah, it's a lot easier, cheaper, to find things and to buy things because uh, there's uh, just much more in, in terms of um, things that are aware. I remember going on a vacation once with the kids and we said if it was a real town it had a Walmart. <laughs> right? Um, and if you got further out west it wasn't Walmart or Target, it was Pomida was the score that kind of, uh, but very small compared to what you and I would think of as uh, a typical department store yeah if you and, and so very often people will go to the city to do shopping you know um, cities offer mass transportation mass transportation yeah you you can get along in a city without a, a vehicle if you know how to use them right and some cities are better than others but uh, um, when my son Josh moved to um, DC to work for the patent office. Uh, he didn't have a car there for the first, boy, at least five years, you know, which restricted some things that, you know, he couldn't get every place he wanted to go when he wanted to get there sometimes. So, um, so the first church he joined was Peace Lutheran Church in DC, and it was because it was the only one he could get somewhere close to with a, a metro stop. And the problem for him was that the metro stop didn't start early in the morning. So he, the only service he could attend was there 11 o'clock. It was called the Urban Contemporary. It was um, a congregation in a changing neighborhood and, and had, had transferred uh, in, into uh, serving that neighborhood very well. So this was pretty much an all African-American service that went anywhere from the times we attended anywhere from about an hour and 45 minutes to two and a half hours, depending. Um, and as, yes, and as, as uh, Josh would say, uh, he warned us before we went to that first service, he said, we don't pass the peace, we give the love. <laughs> so he said, expect to be hugged because you will, there, there, nobody's gonna shake your hand in this place, you know. <laughs> Um, but it, it, you know, it's just a, a different culture. But he could, he could do that, um, and he could attend a service uh, because uh, he uh, had public transportation available to him, and it saved him. Anybody who's lived in a place like D.C. knows that, uh, just like Chicago, to have a parking place and what you what even downtown from Milwaukee. How much extra do you have to pay in some places to have? an inside parking spot and and why is it such a mess in downtown Milwaukee when we have these snowstorms because there's no place for people to park their their cars and if you've ever had a child as I've had or 
uh, relative or somebody who, who decided it was a really cool thing to live, live on the east side for a while. You know, sometimes they go through that phase where they just say it's really cool and then, then they're griping all the time about trying to find parking places or, you know, uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah, but mass transformation. What else do big cities have? I think you're missing one big one, which isn't going on a lot right now. Theater, the arts, libraries. You know, small towns will have libraries too, but nothing like what we have and the resources available to us. But, and you might have a volunteer band or something like that in a small community, but you'll have nothing on the level of a Milwaukee Symphony or a ballet company or a repertory theater or all of the arts tend to flourish only in the places where you have large cities. Um, and very often before and after people go to a theater production or a symphony, they stop someplace to eat. And you don't have the variety of kinds of restaurants and choices and different levels and all of that kind of stuff available to you in a small town. So there's a lot of um, flourishing that happens in, in and around cities. Uh, they tend to congregate. If you think about um, even in the area of business, right, um, you will have, uh, you know, we talk about Silicon Valley. What is that? That's all the tech companies, right? Wall Street, um, a lot of the financial industry, but this is what often happens in cities, is you've got places where people are able to come together and to, um, in their competition and, uh, um, and collaboration with each other, be able to move things forward in terms of uh, our, our societal um, uh, goals. So cities are, are kind of important. Um, what does the Bible have to say about cities? Well, not a lot, but this is one of those places where God says, go and preach to the city, right? To the city of, of Nineveh. I think one of the hard things, I, I would say just a, an observation in our culture is that because of the cultural changes that happen in the city, uh, especially churches like ours tend to abandon the city. If you think about all the churches, for instance, that have closed that are LCMS churches, which ones are they? They're the ones in the inner city. You know, Emmaus is gone. Old Emmanuel is gone. Gospel's still alive. Pastor Guy, um, uh, Kasango Guy Cabello is uh, now there. Uh, pastor, along with being the French-speaking immigrant pastor, so they, kind of saved it it didn't they saved it. Yes, yeah, they did. Because it was close to it was close to, to die. Memorial was close. Um, Bethlehem closed. Um, Christ Memorial is uh, closed. Um, um, yeah. So, pardon? Cross. I think they're still around, but I think they're. Um, but they're at Alka Church, and I, I, there were a couple of mergers in the Alka churches, and um, um, yeah, but there's, if you just think about what's happened um, in, the, uh, in the city, Ebenezer Lutheran Church on the south side would be another one that closed. Um, Emmaus? Emmaus is closed, yeah. And that at one time in the 50s was the largest church in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Emmaus Lutheran Church was the largest church in the Lutheran Church in Missouri Synod in the 50s, late 50s. So, yeah, sometimes, um, and sometimes it's, it's really, really um, uh, difficult because we see a lot of challenges in the, in, in the cities. It, it, it's interesting that um, uh, that there is one place in the scriptures where it tells you to pray for those who are in the city. So you know where that is? Romans? 
Old Testament. I got to look it up. I should have prepared it. And, and um, <clears throat> I know which book it's in, but I'm not exactly sure where. So I'm going to see if I can find it here. Um, sure, it's, if I'm not going to find it. It's not in my limited. Uh, it's in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. And it's there he, he says to them, pray for the city and for its welfare. And, and why does he say that? Well, he's talking to people who are in captivity and they, and they might, you know, um, want to be revolutionaries, but he says instead, settle down, have children, raise your family, and pray for the welfare of the cities. Um, because that's where, of course, many of them went. You don't find people who are coming as immigrants, where do they go? To the cities. And they'll live in little ghettos, in a positive sense ghettos, places where other people like them also live, who speak their same language. And, um, So just thinking a little bit about the blessing and benefit that cities bring, and, and this is a place where God says, uh, go proclaim to the, to the cities. Um, and, and I can tell you that that's a challenge. Um, it's a, a really great challenge, and um, I don't know of a lot of um, churches that are doing really well in the city of any denomination strike, non-denominational. I always occurs to me that, you know, the non-denoms, where do they start most of their churches? On the fringes. On the fringes in the outside, suburbs. Yeah. Yeah. A lot in the suburbs. Yeah. Um, but not in the center of the city. Well, there was one. It was Eastbrook, but that's gone now. Eastbrook has moved out here, right. took over what was St. Anne's, I think, if I remember right. Is that St. Nicholas? Yeah. Or St. Nicholas it was, Catholic Church? Yeah, Epicos is in the city, um, but there just aren't aren't many. I know that um, when while I was at Emmanuel Brookfield, we had talked about it, uh, about possibly trying to think about a way we could start a, a, a mission there. Um, you know, we have Trinity downtown, but they don't really attract people from the city. They attract a lot of people who have a lot of connection to Trinity downtown, or like a real traditional service, but. Um, but it's a very small congregation. But you, you don't find a lot of vitality in Christianity in the cities. And um, Brookfield Lutheran tried to start uh, something on the east side. Um, they called a special pastor, a young guy, trying, I can't remember his name, all I remember is he had tattoos up and down both arms. And the tattoos told the story of the gospel. So they were Christian tattoos, and he used them as a way, because people would say, well, gee, what do you got? And it gave him an opportunity to tell the gospel. That was a tool he used um, to share the gospel. People would be interested, and people, obviously, who like tattoos, which would be you know, a lot of young people, and they'd be curious about why he had the tattoos he had on his arms. And, um, yeah, you wouldn't think of that as being a, it's a portable tract. Right? You don't hand one out, but somebody will say, well, what's that for? And he actually could tell the story of salvation by going down both arms. Um, but, but I know um, I know it didn't work. <laughs> and the reason it didn't work is because then I got a call from uh, Pastor he uh, Heinz at that time, who was a senior pastor at Brookfield, and we were at a manual, and and he said, well, how would you feel? They're looking for a place to kind of establish a, a church. How would you feel if they settled around 124th and, and north? <laughs> and I said, well, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, I'm, if they can attract a, a different uh, people group, a different type of people, I, I don't have any objection. But 124th and north is just up the road from our Redeemer. It's just down the road from us, just 
uh, east of uh, where Brookfield Lutheran is. And, you know, my question was, why would you plant a new church there um, if you were going to plant a church? So it's hard. It's hard. What has happened to Mission of Christ? Mission of Christ continues to exist. Um, I can't tell you exactly who they're served by. I'd have to look it up. The last I knew, um, Pastor F.M. Akani was serving there and that it had become also kind of connected with Hope Lutheran. Excuse me, where, um, uh, oh, I can picture him, but I can't think of his name. He was at, uh, at Emmaus. And then uh, when Pastor Wildauer went into the mission field in Bethlehem closed, then he went to, I can picture him, but I can't think of his name. No, that, that one's still existing. Um, uh, it's a very, very small congregation. Uh, and they have worked a lot with uh, Free at Last Ministry through F.M. McConney, who is also the chaplain at the, um, at the uh, Franklin Correctional Facility. For the LCMS and Ephraim's a, a really good guy. He's a native Nigerian. Um, his dad is the pastor. Um, see, a lot of our 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 um, churches in the city are actually pastored by people who are not African American but Africans. Mm -hmm. um, Elijah Nadan is at um, Holy Ghost, which is still surviving, um, so they still worship. Um, very small. I think they, if I heard right, um, I believe they had a pretty sizable endowment that could help them continue to exist. Um, St. Stephen's has had its ups and downs. I don't know what it's doing now. It's still officially a congregation of the Missouri Senate, but I know they had uh, declined quite a bit. Uh, they were the first Hispanic um, ministry congregation in, in, in uh, the LCMS, um, but they're a uh, very, very small worshiping body of believers. So yeah, there's there's just not a lot of activity in our city. Why do you think that might be so? I know in the Bible says the cities include people plotting against the Lord. A lot of evil in the cities also. There's a lot of evil in the cities, right? If you think about where uh, drug trade emanates from, the hubs are always the cities. What's the problem with um, uh, um, <clears throat> all of the hotels? And we've had that problem in Glendale. I know I've seen, right? Any of the hotels that are near um, uh, exits, uh, handily on, on and off, often become places where both drug uh, trafficking uh, sex trafficking, um, and Wisconsin is one of the worst states for sex trafficking. A lot of people don't know that. Um, Milwaukee is the considered really, the Harvard University to educate others how to do sex trafficking. So it's in, it's incredible, um, you know. Like you say, there's a lot of evil in the in the city as well. So it's got good and bad aspects to it, and. And this is a time, you know, in the book of Jonah, it doesn't tell us a whole lot about the kind of sin that he's calling them to repent from. Uh, but in the book of Jonah, it, it tells us that Jonah, uh, and this is obviously after he'd been swallowed by the big fish, right? So this is when God gave him a second chance. And that's the, the next question. When has God given you two chances? <clears throat> to be or to do what? To witness where? When have you ignored a second chance and why? So just thinking about the application of this, um, has God given you second chances? Every day. <laughs> you know, if you, it, it, I look in my past and I think when I felt the Holy Spirit tapping me on the shoulder, and say, you know, that thoughts are occurring. This is something you should be doing, and so on and so on. And I, you know, and I'm saying, Lord, I don't, I don't have time for that now. I mean, I've got kids at this age. I've got this. I've got that. I just can't do that. You know, I can't knit that into my lifestyle, and so on. But 
the tapping goes on, and that is another chance until circumstances by his leading coalesce. And yeah, it is possible, and, and it, it can happen. So he's working. He's working all the time. Another door of opportunity can can open, and hopefully he doesn't have to have you swallowed by a big fish <laughs> for you to be open to the possibility. I think that uh, I know I'm not alone in this, but for myself, it's uh, even talking with a family member that. That, you, that is very dear to you, but is just adamant uh, about uh, remaining out of the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's difficult then to go back again and go back again and go back again. And, uh, one of the relatives I'm thinking of, his daughter called me after I had Ronald talked to him, giving him something, and she said, well, I read some of it, and he listened politely. I mean, that's really pretty heartbreaking, <laughs> but he did listen. He did listen. Um, so that's something that, is, at least for me, it's been hard to go back. And I've had an example because my sister, my older sister, would come after me <laughs> when I was not attending church. Mm -hmm. And she didn't stop, which I'm very grateful to her for. Um, I think the last thing that she did was give me uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. By C.S. Lewis, yeah. And, uh, Mere Christianity, yes, right. That was very helpful. I mean, it's helped me to try to pass it on. But uh, family members, it's difficult. Family especially is, is challenging because sometimes we're too close to see. And because, well, depending on how we've handled it, um, we may be at a point where they turn a deaf ear to us whenever we talk about it. And and that's that's hard. Karen, I, I think I, I'm not sure if this is the passage you're referring to, but I think I found it in Jeremiah 29, verse 7. Also seek the peace and prosperity of yep. the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to, to the Lord for it, because it pros, if it prospers, you will, you will prosper. For you will prosper. The God, says, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prospering, prophesying lies. To you in my name, I have not sent them. The yeah, what 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 he was talking about there is that that there were those prophets who were saying, "Oh, we're going to be done with this soon. That God will get over His anger and and we'll get back." And 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 God says through Jeremiah, "Uh, uh. So so stay here and and pray for the prosperity of that city." continue to live in this land, you know, take wives and all that kind of stuff because you're going to be here a while. And as a result, if the city prospers, then you're going to prosper as well. Um, yeah, Marjorie? I think that could, that could stand for the same political situation we're fighting ourselves in. So when you pray for our administration, you know, some people might wince, but, but, we that is our that is one of our our hopes, and that we pray for people to keep us like you say for peace. For peace, peace, yeah. In our yep. And it, so it's a it's a reason to pray for a government you don't necessarily agree with, whether you're agreeing with Biden now or not, or whether you are agreeing with Trump or not. And it, you don't pray for a person; you pray for the prosperity of the country. When when it does well then we're all going to do well as well. So, so God raises all votes. <laughs>
Um, it's interesting, we don't have much in the way of what uh, Jonah actually said. So it says, Jonah began by going a day's journey in the city and proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. I don't think that's all he said, you know. Um, so we get just a, a snippet of uh, what uh, he calls, and, and even as I said, we don't know how exactly what was going on in Nineveh. All God says is, its wickedness has come up before me, and the idea is that it's, the stench has kind of arisen to God's nostrils and uh, to the point where he says, I need to do something about it. But, um, but the, uh, the reaction is, is one of, of, um, uh, of repentance. And as you think a little bit about that, um, uh, what does it mean that, uh, and, and what is this whole idea about fasting and putting on sackcloth? What do you know about fasting in the Bible? It was a, wasn't it a, a method of worship? It could be. Is it commanded in the Bible? I don't think it's commanded. It's... One day out of the year. Oh, oh. What's the one day out of the year that fasting yeah, is commanded in the Bible? Yeah. Yom Kippur. Atonement. The day of atonement, yeah. the day of covering, is the only time that fasting is commanded in the Old Testament. It's the only time. Did other pe people fast at other times? Yes. And why did they do it? What was it a sign of? Well, it's a sign of it here. One was repentance. Grief and repentance. and repentance. It's some time of sorrow, whether it's sorrow over a personal loss or sorrow over sin. It was uh, an indication that I'm sorry. Um, does Jesus command fasting ever? Maybe in his examples, but not... He can commend it, but not command it. He can say it's a good practice, but it's never commanded in Scripture except on the Day of Atonement. It's the only day. It tells you something about how important that day is. You know, in the Jewish calendar, it's the most important day, actually, in the Jewish calendar. Um, it takes precedence even over Passover. And... Um, by all the cars that have lined up on Port Washington yeah. Road there. For a Day of Atonement. One time a year. Yeah. Well, and I remember when I was here before that there was a day that they canceled school and most of the schools on the North Shore here because kids wouldn't come to school anyway. And if a third of, at that time, I think at Nicolave, around 30 to 40 percent of the population was Jewish. And, um, and so if 30 to 40 percent of the kids were going to be gone, why have school? Then you're just playing catch up the next day. So I know, at least at that time, Day of Atonement was a day, whenever it fell, that they always had a holiday. Um, something that doesn't happen in too many other school districts in our state, right? So uh, fasting was a sign of repentance, and that's what the Day of Atonement is, and that's why it was tied to repentance. It's commended at times in Scripture, but it is never commanded. Um, never commanded. Uh, so the, the fast was proclaimed, and they put on sackcloth. Um, again, a sign of, of, um, of sorrow. Even the king, it tells us in... Um, did this from the greatest to the least. The king takes off of his robes, and, um, and this is in verse 6. He takes off, gets up from his throne, takes off his royal robes, covers himself with sackcloth, and sits down in the dust. And they turn to God, and God has compassion. Now, you and I know the rest of the story. How did, Noah, how did Jonah feel about that? was not happy. He wanted to see fireworks. He wanted to see... Yeah. He, he, wanted, uh, he wanted punishment instead of grace. 
That's why he wasn't in control of it. So, it, why, why do we have that this week? It's because it's, um, it's a case where in the Old Testament you've got um, one of the prophets of God sent not to the people of Israel but to the ends of the earth. To another place, to another people. And one of the things we're going to focus on this week, I'm just putting the sermon together a little bit, is this whole concept of... Um, of um, of people groups and uh, I'm going to see if I can show a little video about defining what a people group is what an unreached people group is and then there's an unreachable unreached people group what do we mean by that well, a people group is an ethnic group, and so, for instance, I've mentioned in Uganda there's one nation, but there are at least 56 different tribal languages, you know, and so there are 56 different people groups in that country. And when we think about people groups, then there's actually a group that's called, um, well, there's a couple of different groups. Uh, Joshua 1-9 is the, one of the groups, and it's uh, the Joshua Project, and it it maps and tracks how many people groups in this world have been reached with the gospel. There's, um, I want to say something like 16,000 they've counted people groups, people with unique languages and cultures. Um, and, um, and of those people groups, um, how many are unreached and where are those unreached people groups? And when they talk about unreached people groups, I, I will show you a, a map on, on, um, on uh, Sunday in the sermon, but it's what they call the 1040 window. And it has to do with latitude and longitude. Um, that most of the unreached people groups are right around the equator in a band that runs from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. Oh, well, actually to the Pacific, Atlantic to the Pacific. And what they mean by an unreached people group is that there's less, uh, there's only about one to two percent of the population that are actually Christian. And so the thinking behind that is that's not enough Christians to help that, that nation become Christian, to reach out to all the people who are there. Why else might there be this 1040 window in that particular section of the world, if you can picture it in your brain? What else is going on in the middle of that section that would make a lot of unreached people groups there? And many of them unreachable. Conflict? Tribalism? There can be conflict or tribalism. Um, but sometimes the conflict or tribalism allows you to actually reach them because they come into things called refugee camps. And who helps to take care of people in refugee camps? A lot of Christians. Franklin Graham. Right? Franklin Graham. Absolutely. A lot of refugee work is done um, in, those, in those camps. And that's often where people first have an opportunity to hear about Jesus. I remember we resettled a... a uh, a family uh, at Emmanuel from um, Southeast Asia and um, I'm trying to remember exactly where they were from I think they were B Burmese people who had been in a, a refugee camp in Thailand and um, they ended up being Christian when they came which kind of surprised us a little bit but they were really beholden to the Seventh-day Adventists because who worked in their refugee camp? The Seventh-day Adventists. And, um, and so they would come to church by us once in a while, but most often they went to the Seventh-day Adventists because those were the people who had introduced them to Jesus uh, in, their, in their camp. So sometimes uh, that that consternation in the other nations opens doors of opportunity for the gospel to, to, to reach into peoples who otherwise wouldn't be there. But why wouldn't it originally get to them? Well, just think about the governments that are in that window. A lot of them have 
state religions and what are a lot of their state religions? Well, a good portion of them are Muslim. If you look at all of the nations, I did this a little while back. Um, it's the number of a number of nations that have state religions and then what those state religions are. Well, there's only two that are Christian. And I can't remember what the second one is, but the first one you should know. Which, which Western nation has a state religion? The United Kingdom. The Church of England. That's in that band. Pardon? That's in that band? Uh, no, that's not in that band, but that is a... Uh, I'm, now I'm, I've moved on to something else, and that's this. How many of the nations that exist in the world have state religions? Well, there's around 50. The majority of them are Muslim. And unlike England, where while they have a state religion, other religions can also be present and practice and, right, and have worship houses, most of the Muslim countries don't allow anybody else to do any kind of work in and among them. And uh, another big country in that band, um, uh, is uh, the other two major religions in that band are Hindus in India. And um, if you follow anything in terms of, of international uh, relationships and religions, you, you'll see that Christians often get persecuted. There have been, you know, churches that have been burned down by the Hindus and that kind of thing because the Hindus don't want anybody else in. There's a lot of conflict between Hindus and Muslims in India because... Parts of India are Muslim, a very small part, large parts are Hindu, and they don't mix very well. And they don't want, it's, we are so used to, you know, this is probably one of our <laughs> things going on in our country right now, the, the whole idea of free speech, you get to say what you want to say, right? The president is possibly going to, the ex-president is possibly going to be impeached. Well, he was impeached by the House of Representatives, but... Will he be convicted? Probably not because he's not going to get that support. I mean, they're not going to get that support in the Senate, at least the way it looks. But one of the defenses of that president or anybody else who, uh, President Trump or anybody else who speaks politically is you can pretty much say what you want to say. You know, and... Um, I know one of the frustrations, um, I don't know about you, but as a, as a citizen of this country, is I just see um, not an equal, necessarily, um, uh, treatment of people, whether it's in media um, or in the law. So um, I remember uh, not that long ago, it was uh, uh, now the majority leader, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, who was saying basically let's take over the uh, Supreme Court. I don't know if you remember that video, but that was right after, was it Gorsuch got uh, approved and, you know, he was on the steps of the Supreme Court saying, we gotta throw, you know. And much the same thing as what Trump said. Now, now of course, their leaders didn't go in and occupy the Supreme Court. But if you look at the language, it was very similar. It was very similar. And the, the challenge for us is, is that, um, uh, that I think when we're l looking at how uh, all of this goes on in our culture and in our world, um, that we have something in our country that very few other countries have, and that is the opportunity to speak freely, even say stupid stuff, you know? And most of the time, you can't get arrested for saying stupid stuff. <laughs> but in other countries, they don't have that freedom. And so in many of those countries that are in that 1040 window, uh, one of the challenges for us is we don't have an opportunity to be able to witness in that window because it's against the law. You know, servicemen who, are, who go into that area to serve are told do not you know, display a Bible in public, do not give one to anybody because it's against the law. Nobody here would be um, 
put into prison for giving somebody else a Quran. I have one in my library. I do too. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we have the opportunity to be able to talk about those things in a way that in a lot of other cultures, they don't have that opportunity. And, and so this is one of the challenges when it comes to reaching the ends of the earth is it's not always easy. Now, I, I'm going to go to um, the gospel, and we're just going to cover that one real briefly, I think, because um, of what it says. This is Jesus teaching about the end times, and it's reflected in the same way in the gospel of Matthew uh, but we're in series B, so we're in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, so would you read Mark 13 with me? As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you, Many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, first question here is, have you ever been ridiculed for your faith, for, for standing up for truth, rather than go along with the crowd? And was it worth it? Why or why not? Have you ever been ridiculed for your faith? Oh, yeah. At work all the time. At work all the time. On Facebook. On Facebook. Now, my primary experience of that, obviously, I don't get ridiculed for it too much around here, right? Mm -hmm. But my primary experience was in the workplace as well, um, being ridiculed for your faith. Had a few people I've ministered to along the way that um, were really, really reticent about accepting Jesus as a savior and and started with a bit of animosity. I remember one fellow in my second congregation, his wife asked me if I would go visit him, but she said, you know, he really doesn't like pastors and he doesn't like the church. <laughs> but he had had a stroke and he was in a uh, a long-term care facility and she said, I would really appreciate it if you would just, you know, stop by and See, well, I mean, the guy tolerated me for a while, um, and I would just come every week, every month, and uh, and he had, he had actually grown up in the church, so he had some church background. But I would go every week, and or not every week, every month. Just he was on our monthly shut-in calls, and I would go every month and and visit with him and. And one of the things I, I did was uh, I always asked his permission. Um, and I learned that from uh, Leroy Wiesenthal. He said, you know, if you ask permission, people will often give it to you. And uh, if you just go ahead and do it, um, they might get angry with you. But, but one of the ways that you can open the door is by asking for permission. So I would just, can I share... A, uh, a word of God with you, you know, and he'd just say, go ahead, you know, and um, when we were um, concluding a visit, usually I'd say, would, would it be okay if I, would you, would it be okay if I prayed, but I always asked for permission, and if he said no, which he didn't very often, but once in a while he would, 
say, okay. The next time I'd ask them the same question. And eventually uh, the door opened a little bit, but it took, it, 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 it took months for that to happen. It wasn't overnight. <clears throat> and uh, so, yeah, when, when, when you and I experience a, a rejection, it, it, it's happened a couple of times and we've asked waiters and waitresses uh, if we could pray for them. Uh, but I can tell you it's happened uh, less than a handful of times. And I think Jerry and I have been doing this for almost 10 years now. And uh, just did it yesterday up at First Watch. Um, had a lunch meeting and asked the waitress. And she said, yeah, would you pray for my unborn baby? Now, she didn't look pregnant at all. But she said she was eight weeks. And that she had had in the past a, a challenge carrying babies to term. So would you pray? So, just a wonderful opportunity to bless somebody. And then you know, when we left, she thanked us, not just for being her customers, but especially for the prayer. Did you pray with her there at that time? I always ask them if they're comfortable with that. So, in this case, I didn't, so, but I will have people say, well, I say, would you like to stay here while we pray? Sometimes it's because they're too busy, oh, yeah. you know, and, and they're hustling. And she was hustling, so she didn't stay with us. But I've had waiters and waitresses in, them, uh, in other times stay with us and, and pray. Yeah, Deb. Um, I, I just have to share this. Remember those ornaments? Yep. Okay, well, I took one and I gave it to my hairdresser. And um, I, I said, you know, and I started talking about she's divorced, you know, she's, or she's getting divorced and all of these problems. And they, Family's disjointed, and um, I talked about St. John's, and, and she was brought up Lutheran, but she really doesn't have a church. And, you know, I said, well, you know, just, you know, I, you're going to be in my prayers. You know, you're welcome to come to St. John's. we got a cool pastor. You'll like him, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I told Pastor. So Pastor gave me this book that talked about, you know, when you're going through a divorce, but it was very Christian based. I didn't. It didn't, and it, there was one page that addressed what to do when you're now ostracized with your, from your friends because you're divorced. So I went to see her last week, and I sat down, and she was just like all bubbly, and she goes, she goes, Debbie, she goes, I have to tell you, you inspired me. She goes, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I, huh. I said. She's a Sunday school teacher. I said, what? <laughs> She said, I read your book, she goes, and I, I, you know, I marked it all up and I got to read it again. She said, but she said, after you talked to me, she said, I realized that we needed church in our lives. And so I said, kids, let's go to church. And something to do with the Catholic Church, like one of her sons had been confirmed. So she, anyway, she went to Lumen Christi. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, attended the service there and she was really good with the little kids and she was kind of, you know, and then somebody asked her, you know, you make a good Sunday school teacher. <laughs> so she is a Sunday school teacher. So she went from not teaching, not being involved at all, to being a Sunday school teacher. And, and you know, I love it. She goes, she goes, and you know what? She goes, my kids love it. She says, we get up, we go to church, we have this routine. She goes, even my my husband, whom I'm divorcing, now, <laughs> now comes and sits with the kids at church. And they have this routine where after church they go to, you know, to brunch or lunch or, and the kids are like going to Sunday school. And I was just, I thought, I got to tell the pastor. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's a great story. You just, if you're just planting seeds, you don't know. Yeah, Gail, here. Well, I have a, as um, Ridge and I, I have gotten the um, ornaments and Ridge and I went to Calderon Club and nobody was really up there. And so we decided we we're going to have dinner there. And we used to go there a lot, so we knew a lot of the people there. Well, there was a new waitress. And I'm digging in my purse, which usually weighs about 50 pounds. And Rich said, how many ornaments do you got in there? You know? <laughs> and I said, well, I haven't given one out yet. So I said, I'm going to give the waitress. And yeah, OK, you know. So when she came, I said, oh, I'd like to. I said, we belong to St. John's down the street, a Lutheran church. I said. And we have these beautiful ornaments, and I'd like to give you one. And she took it, and she started crying. And we're sitting there, and she said, you don't know how much this means to me. My sister and I just moved here from Venezuela. 
Wow. She said, my grandma lived here, and they were getting an apartment near wherever her grandma lived, and they just bought their first Christmas tree and had no ornaments. <laughs> and she said, this will be our first ornament. And my sister just came here. You know, she didn't know if any other family members were going to be able to join her. She was like thrilled to death about this one ornament. Yeah, yeah. And then Chris and I were at Cafe 1505, and there's a, a fellow there that works. He waited on us, and when I paid for the check, I put the ornament in there. Yeah. Well, a different guy <laughs> came to take my my check, and I said to Chris, and, oh, I meant that ornament for John, because he had just gotten married, sure. and we've been yeah. kind of talking to him about faith and stuff. Yeah. And I meant it for John, and a different guy picked it up. And I was all commiserating, and I said to Chris, and, oh, I wanted John to have the ornament, and I had just this one now with me. And Chris goes, but well, Mom, maybe the guy that picked it up needed it more than And I was like, I wasn't thinking that way. And I thought, you know, it was really, it was a challenge, but it was, it was fun to see the growth of what those things had brought. Those are, those are great stories. And all you can do is plant the seed, and you just don't know whose life you're going to touch in that particular way and uh, and what might come out of it so um, those are all kingdom win stories we say right and i felt like i said to rich because he always kind of gets a little like oh should you do it here and, and i'm just like you know what if we're not both for our faith and you can't share it it's not yeah it, it does nothing you know it does nothing it's like you have to be a little bit more bold about it be you know Okay, passionate about sharing. Do you have any marbles for them? <laughs> <laughs> no, we sold out. Um, we sold out. Too bad they don't make something Easter-like for that you could use as well. But um, Just thinking about this passage, what might the disciples have felt as Jesus was describing the destruction of Jerusalem, the signs of the end, and the persecution of Christians? Fear. <laughs> Yeah, I always think, did they say, is this what I signed up for? Maybe a little bit of disbelief, because I think a lot of the things that Jesus tried to get across to the disciples, they just had a hard time believing. Yeah, yeah, it didn't always sink in, and they didn't always believe. They didn't always understand it, right. you know. Um, when one of the my favorite questions of the disciples comes right before Jesus ascended into heaven, and they said, well, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? And I can just hear Jesus going, you guys have been with me for three years, and you don't get it yet. What's wrong with you, you know? And this is just before he's going to send into heaven and hand the kingdom growth into their hands. You'd think he'd say, what in the world? You know, but Jesus doesn't do that. Because the disciples didn't get stuff, it kind of makes me feel not so bad about the things I don't understand. Right. Right. It's like you, they were right there with them, but they didn't get it. If they were with them for three years and they still didn't understand right. everything, you know, do we have to understand everything all the time? No. 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 Well, I, I think some of that might have been neutral in a way. I mean, in other words, they weren't totally fearful. I think they kind of expected some of that, though, because he was still a controversial person, and they knew he was controversial. And they also thought at first that his kingdom would be on earth, right. and uh, a lot of people left him because he wasn't going to overthrow the Romans and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know, because he wasn't that kind of He wasn't that messiah. kind of messiah that was going to overthrow the Romans. Yeah, yeah. so I think that, I, I would think in some cases they might have been fearful, but on other cases... They might have thought, oh, yeah, well, I guess this is to be expected because we hung around with this guy and he's gotten into a lot of trouble, so I guess we're going to get in a lot of trouble too. And that they are. Now, verse 10 is the reason though, why I chose this particular lesson for this weekend. What does verse 10 teach us? Jesus wanted the gospel good news to be preached to everyone. And the end of the world will not come until. And realize that the word nation here again is the same word in the original language that's in the Great Commission. It's not the word nation as a geopolitical group, but ethne, 
where we get the word ethnic group from. This is the people groups. And <clears throat> it's one of the reasons why some Christians, as they read a passage like this, say, well, then we should be concerned about the people groups. Do they have a witness to Christ in their particular country? And what can we do to leverage our work so that more people in those countries where they don't have uh, a Christian witness among some of the people groups can happen. You know, the Bible translators, that's a big part of their work is trying to translate the Bible into the heart language of, of every people group, which is a, a daunting task sometimes because many of the languages that they start translating in don't even have a written language. It's, it might be an oral culture, um, which means you learn language just orally. There is no, there were no grammar books, you know. There were no classes in how to learn to speak that way. You just learned it the way you learn English. You learned it from your mom and dad by listening. Long before you could read, you could talk, right, and put sentences together. When our grandson, who's going to be three on the 1st of March, when he comes over, the minute he's in the door, he's talking a blue streak, asking Grandma all kinds of questions, talking to me. He's talking all the time. Well, what lessons did he ever have, right? And so a lot of cultures are oral cultures like that. And, um, and part of the translation process is actually coming up with a written language that then you can translate the scriptures into. But this is the passage that tells us until the people groups are reached, the end isn't going to come. So when somebody says um, to me, well, you know, this is the end of the world, and boy, aren't all these signs things, uh, the world might, sounds like it's going to be the end. Well, I say, has this passage been fulfilled? If it hasn't, then, and this is the only one that I would say that, if it hasn't, then it seems to me it's not quite time yet but because he wants the gospel to go out to all nations. And the last question is, how would or should this move us to follow Jesus in the light of this truth? What's our job? Follow Jesus. Follow, <laughs> follow Jesus. <laughs> but to be concerned about this, ends of the earth, to be concerned about where is the gospel not breached yet? Um, and, and what's my part in helping that gospel get to all of those places? And that, that means becoming aware of, of where those places are and, and being supportive of helping to develop um, a Christian witness in there. And that can happen in a couple of different ways. It can happen first in, in, um, in going to those places, but it also can happen, as I was talking about this last uh, Monday night, because we didn't have Sunday worship. Uh, but the example from um, uh, the one missions guy who went up to Concordia, Portland, and there were all these people from Muslim countries who were learning English in Concordia, Portland, but none of the Concordia, Portland students were interacting with them. And he went over and talked to them and found out that they really wanted interaction with English students. Because it would give them practice, first of all, in terms of um, learning their own, learning the English language and being able to use it conversationally. The more conversations you have, the better your English is going to be. And that's one of the reasons they were there. But the other thing they wanted to do is to learn about our culture. Because many of the things that we do, did they have any understanding of what Christmas is? No. Because nobody celebrates Christmas in their culture. You know? They understand what Good Friday or Easter is. Well, no, because they don't celebrate those things there. And, and, and probably many of them hadn't even heard of it, you know. And, and so now that they're in our country, we have an opportunity to be able to share with them things that allow them, when they go back, to at least have a broader understanding and maybe be open to the gospel. It's one of the reasons why in many of our uh, in many of our campus ministries, one of the big outreaches is to people of other countries and cultures. Um, at Luther Memorial in Shorewood, they have an outreach to especially UWM students, but they're, 
they, they focus on trying to get those foreign students who are here, and this year obviously not as many because of COVID, um, but try to give them an opportunity to come to learn uh, to know the gospel. Um, many of our high schools, especially our Lutheran high schools, have had in recent years, again, not so much this year because of COVID, but have had especially people from um, other countries uh, come and learn at the school and people pay an exorbitant rate to have their, their children schooled in our high schools. Um, but if you know uh, Martin Luther on the south side, yeah, um, uh, the, the building, if you've been down there lately, there's a building in front of the school, which is a, an apartment dorm room. Um, proud to say my son was a designer of that. Um, in his, his architecture firm. Uh, but yeah, they purposely built that so that they could house students primarily from Southeast Asia whose parents want their kids schooled in the United States. And, um, and we're having trouble finding enough, uh, you know, kind of like uh, AFS uh, uh, homes for those kids to live in. And, and uh, and, and one of the things those kids have an opportunity to do is for the, many of them, for the first time, is hearing about Jesus. And that's not only true of the kids who come from other places, but it's sometimes kid, true of the kids who've grown up in the United States. I remember the first time that I ever ran into this was when I was pastor here 20 years ago, and one of our school parents, she was a Christian, Lutheran, um, went to one of our, our city uh, grade schools and her her uh, children were enrolled here, and um, when I first spoke, spoke to her, her husband did not attend church, and, and she said, Pastor, you have to understand, he was um, 20 years old, and he did not understand what Christmas was, and he grew up in the United States. And you and I would say, how is that possible? Yeah. Right? Uh, but she said he, he had never really heard the Christmas story from a Christian point of view. He knew about Santa Claus, but he didn't know that the whole story was really about Jesus' birth. There's a lot of people now that don't know that either. And that's, that's when I say things flipped a little bit in our country. Um, I used to, when I first came out in the ministry, could always expect that most people had a basic understanding of the Christian story, even if they were unchurched because maybe their parents sent them to Sunday school because that would be good for them, even if mom and dad didn't go to church. But I'll tell you, when I was here 20 years ago, that had already flipped. And you could not count on the fact that people who were coming um, or were investigating Christianity actually had uh, an understanding of the Christmas or of the Christian story. Um, um, so it's, it's that challenge that we're facing, not just with people outside, but that's one of the things we can do, you know, is, is to when we know somebody is here visiting from another culture and we have some kind of interaction or an opportunity to, to host them, um, to invite them to spend some time with you. You know, um, I don't know that they've ever asked for it, but, um, you know, I, be curious if Luther Memorial, I haven't been on this side of town for a while, but when they're doing that, if they would look for host homes for a couple of these uh, kids who, who when school shut down over things like Christmas and Easter break, need a, a place to, to, you know, just go and socialize and, and have fun. So invite them to your Christmas and invite them to your Easter, invite them uh, to share some time with you and, and get to know them and, and have an opportunity to, um, to share with them what uh, uh, what we believe and why we believe it. Uh, and then when they go back home, they're going to have a different perspective of how Christians are because they've met some personally and had personal dialogue with them. Okay, let's, um, well, I think we're nearing up on our time. So... Um, when, um, let's just do it this way, just to kind of close out, because I think it's a wonderful word of uh, affirmation for us today. Um, 
So the first question for the epistle, we're not going to read it right now, is when you were young, who, who changed the way you thought about yourself or about others or more motivated you to change your behavior? Um, I'll give you a personal example for me to start and see if anybody's got another one like that. Uh, I'll be very honest with you, uh, with my body build, my, my brothers and, uh, always picked on me for being fat. And um, uh, I was always heavier. I, I have always been um, heavier, and, and I got picked on a lot, especially by my siblings. Now, I find it funny because I think I got the flattest stomach of the three of us right now, but, <laughs> you know. Um, but I'll tell you, the guy who changed it for me was in, in seventh grade in, in public school when I was at uh, La Falla Junior High School. And I was, um, I was in a PE class, and the guy who was the head of the PE class asked if I wanted to wrestle. And so I started wrestling, and he gave me a different view of my body. I didn't see myself as being so much fat as being strong. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, it was at that time that my body changed a little bit um, because in spite of my stature, I was pretty quick. Um, I could outrun most of the linemen on our football team, for instance, when I was a freshman, and that's why I became a fullback and not a guard or tackle. Um, but he's the one who really changed my view of myself when it came to how I perceived myself and my body and what I might be capable of doing. And it started with seventh grade wrestling. Um, and somebody who said, I think you might be good at this. I think you should come and work out with us. So anybody uh, have a story about somebody who maybe had an impact that helped you change the way you looked at yourself? or others. Not me, I was the brother that picked on my sister. <laughs> you were the brother that picked on your sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gail? Well, I remember when your sister had her back mm -hmm. issues, Kim? Mm -hmm. Kim did, my sister. And when I was at Martin Luther, I was a pom-pom girl when I was a cheerleader back in the day from Hills Corners. So I always um, <clears throat> kind of prided myself on being athletic. And, um, you know, you were always looked upon as like one of the it people. But I think it was between my sophomore and um, junior year, I tried out and I didn't make it. And Mrs. Sprecher, who was the yeah, the um, coach, Mrs. Yeah. Sparker, yeah. She called me in because I was really devastated. And she pretty much told me that they wanted your sister finally could oh. be part of it yeah. because she got the brace off. A brace off her back, She yeah. said, we thought that, <clears throat> you know, we wanted to have room for Kim, and we thought you'd be the best person to take a, a leave. Huh. Because of my personality. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> he said, we knew that because you were sweet and you would see the efforts that we were trying to achieve. Yeah. But, and I was like, and it, it changed my whole perspective of being the it person huh. and all that stuff. And I thought, you know, some, they saw something in me, I, I guess. Didn't I was, see in yourself. Yeah, at that and I was, I was still sad about it. You probably said, oh, uh, yeah, sure, pick the yeah, teacher's I mean, kid. Yeah, I mean, no, but I, I think it made me realize sometimes the compassion you have to have for other people. Yeah. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool that somebody else would see that in you. And, well, and, a teacher of all, I mean, and then have the care to express it to you. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, I'm going to end with these first four verses. So if you'll read with me, uh, turn back and, and just go with these uh, words kind of as a benediction. So um, let's read the first four verses of the Romans passage. 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So go with this blessing. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because what we couldn't do, God did for us in the sending of his Son to be a sin offering for us. And this is our comfort even when we talk about our responsibility to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. Um, we're never going to be perfect or consistent at doing it, but what we do know is perfect and consistent is God's love for us in Christ Jesus. And, um, and we've been able to celebrate some wonderful stories about planting seeds. And I just want to encourage you to, to be about that business in whatever way uh, God gives it to you, uh, planting seeds in the hearts and lives of other people and just giving it to God to let him bear the fruit at the appropriate time. Um, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the gift of this day and um, for blessing us with your word. And we just ask that your spirit would, through that word, prompt us uh, this day. And as we continue to follow your Son, our Savior, Jesus, to uh, see and seize the opportunities to be a witness, not only in our Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but even as we have opportunity to the ends of the, of the earth. We thank you for those many ministries that touch the hearts of foreigners who come to study among us, to learn and grow of us, to work among us, and ask that you would continue to bring them into contact with uh, faithful followers of your son so that they might uh, be exposed to the love and grace to, that comes through him so that they might have the confidence that we have that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. See you next week. I just had a question. I just got to flash you guys, um, Walgreens is now going to be giving, we got a thank you.